We are live. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining myself and Jennifer. It's so great to have you guys here and so great that we can talk about this topic today. I know that it's a topic not often discussed, so I'm just happy that we can share this with all of you. Our topic today will be whether nickel allergy is affecting your skin and whether it's affecting your flare ups and your eczema as well. So my guest today is Jennifer Brand and I'll let her introduce herself later. Today, we are gonna talk all about what is nickel, what is a nickel allergy and what are some nickel allergy statistics out there we'll also talk about what are some of the symptoms of nickel allergy how do you even test for nickel allergy if you have it and we're going to talk about what kind of diet is suitable for someone who does have this nickel allergy and we're going to talk more about where you can find it because i know a lot of you had questions about that and you submitted it through social media so we're going to get started. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always good to be part of your show. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to having this discussion today. Thank you so much. So Jennifer Brand is a clinical and integrative nutritionist. She's also the founder of Jennifer Karen Brand Nutrition. She specializes in childhood skin rashes, food allergies, sensitivities, and gut problems as well. So Jennifer has been on this show before. And is there anything else you want to share about yourself, Jennifer, before we get started? Um, well, I just, I really love doing this work. I find it um, very gratifying to be able to work in particular with children and help them feel better. You know, I just, I, I think a lot of us have, especially in this field, you know, have gone through our own health challenges, some of that, you know, as children, and it's always a struggle, you know, and I'm, that type of practitioner who's had my own health issues. And I really want to help guide other people, you know, even having a background in this, it still can be really challenging to navigate health issues, you know, even when you're educated about it. And so I want to be that guidance for parents to help get children through this. And my goal would be like, get kids in early enough so that by the time they're old enough to remember anything, like they have no clue that any of this even happened, right? So yeah. they just go on to be happy, healthy children, adolescents and adults. For sure. Thank you for sharing about that. So today we are talking all about nickel allergy. And we also had someone who commented and I love his response. He said, whoa, what is nickel allergy? So that's the big question today. So Jennifer, I will let you get into it and you can feel free to share what is nickel and what is a nickel allergy? Sure, sure. So yeah, so starting off, so what is nickel? So nickel is a naturally occurring metal. It's actually the fifth most common element on earth and it's found widely in the earth's crust and core. It's also common in meteorites. I like that little tidbit. I think it's interesting. Um, but really like our modern way of life has increased exposure to metals um, through the skin and we come in contact with metals daily. So nickel, um, along with like gold, silver, copper, cobalt, but nickel is found everywhere in the environment. And it's widely used in jewelry and coins, um, cell phones, dental materials like braces. It's also in cooking utensils. It can be in some medications and supplements. Cosmetic products contain nickel, and that can be problematic for some people. Um, and because it's found in the earth, it can easily find its way into soil and water, which means it makes its way into our food, both plant and animal foods. And when it comes to nickel allergy, so a metal allergy in general is an inflammatory delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. So that means it typically happens about 12 hours after exposure to the allergen. Um, and reactions to metals like nickel typically result in a contact dermatitis. So we see a reaction where the allergen had contact with the skin, but sometimes the reactions can be systemic. So which means that the allergen causes a reaction through the circulatory system, which can affect any 
part of the body causing widespread rashes. Um, this can happen. So if somebody is sensitized or allergic to an allergen, then once they're exposed to it in food and cosmetics and, you know, any of those other, um, other things, then they can have that systemic reaction. So a nickel allergy can also result in the dyshydrotic eczema, the blistery hand eczema, and the hands are the most commonly affected sites for the systemic nickel dermatitis. Um, in terms of statistics, it's interesting, about 10 to 15 percent of the population is uh, projected to suffer from like a contact hypersensitivity to metal. And nickel allergy is more common in women than in men approximately 10% of women versus 2% of men. Um, it's also more common in people with autoimmune conditions. And what happens with nickel allergy, so first we get sensitized to it, right? So uh, ions get, like metal ions, they get released from the nickel, and these are potent allergens that can trigger skin inflammation. So when we come into contact with them, they can penetrate the skin, they activate immune cells in the skin that release various chemical messengers, and this sets off you know, the immune system and can sensitize somebody to nickel so that when they're exposed to it again, it can result in the symptoms of an allergy. And once somebody is sensitive to it, it tends to persist um, for life, unfortunately. People of any age can be affected by this. Um, and it's actually the prevalence of nickel allergy is higher in people with certain jobs. So like hairdressers have a higher prevalence of it. And women get sensitized more often than men and more often by non-work related exposures like earrings, right? So jewelry that we wear, ear piercing, cosmetics, whereas men, you know, tend to get sensitized if they do at work. So, you know, for men that work in industries that involve, you know, metals. Um, and some people get reactions from the skin uh, from a brief exposure to it, while other people develop an allergy after long-term contact with nickel. Um, hives, which is a type one hypersensitivity response, so that's more of an immediate reaction, can result from dietary exposure. So if somebody eats something with nickel in it, it's actually rare, according to the literature, that a rash develops in an area other than where nickel was in contact with the skin, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I uh, have someone who said, I have wondered about this. I have severe dry eyes, really red eyelids. Oh, and, and Jen, I remember um, we had someone on Instagram who asked if nickel allergy is, can it be found in stainless steel, like pots and cutlery? Yes. And the answer to that is yes. So stainless steel um, utensils, cooking utensils do contain some nickel. And so, and so do also like canned beverages, canned foods, like the nickel can dissociate from the cans and get into the food. Also, when it comes to the stainless cookware and cooking utensils, um, generally they release like a very small amount of nickel. But if you cook like acidic foods with those utensils, like tomatoes, um, tomato product, citrus, you know, just foods that are acidic, um, that can like leach the metal ions out of the cooking utensils and they can get into the food. That mm -hmm. makes sense. I had another person who said, is this related to the copper IUD? That's a good question. You know, people that have some metal allergy could potentially be sensitive to different metals. Um, so some of like the metals on the periodic table of elements, we'll get into chemistry here for a second, if you know what the periodic table is. <laughs> so like, you know, nickel, cobalt, you know, some of those other metals are next to each other on the periodic table, which means that they have similar chemical properties. So if somebody is sensitized or allergic to one metal, it's possible that they can have sensitivity to other metals as well. That makes sense, kind of like a cross reaction, like how we have with foods. If you're sensitive to one food group, you might be sensitive to another as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So I know one thing we also wanted to talk about is a big question. How do we test for nickel allergy? Yeah, this is a short answer to this one. It's <laughs> mainly diagnosed by patch testing. So 
you would want to talk to your doctor and find out if you actually have like IgE, you know, type reactions to it. Um, the other thing you could do, I'm not a fan of elimination diets because we, it's a slippery slope. You know, we take some foods out of the diet, people might feel better for a little while, symptoms come back, they take more foods out of the diet, and, you know, diet really isn't the root cause of the problem in general. If you are actually allergic or sensitive to nickel and suspect it, definitely go get tested to find out. The other thing you could try, um, the challenging thing is nickel is found in so many foods. So it's really impossible to avoid it 100%. So there are foods that are generally higher in nickel. Um, so you can try and take those higher in nickel foods out of the diet for about a month to see if you feel better. Um, foods that are higher in nickel are things like whole wheat, whole grain, rye, millet, buckwheat, teas and coffees, um, kidney beans and legumes like peas, lentils, peanuts, chickpeas, canned foods and beverages. Um, there, it, it, there are lots of foods that have nickel in them. And we can provide too. There's some lists that I like to send people, um, some resources. So if you do want to try a short-term elimination diet to see if it helps with symptoms, that's something else you can do to determine you know, whether or not you are sensitive to nickel. But number one, go get tested. That's great. Thank you so much, Jen. I think another thing that we wanted to touch upon as well is nickel allergy and cobalt allergy and vitamin B12 supplements. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting one. It goes back to, you know, the periodic table of elements, right? So nickel and cobalt next to each other. So they have those similar chemical properties. Um, so reactions to nickel are more common to cobalt, but the two are often linked. Um, they're found to coexist in a number, in, in a lot of people. But so vitamin B12 supplements actually contain cobalt in the chemical structure of the molecule. So if somebody is allergic to cobalt, they could potentially react to vitamin B12 supplements. Um, so if you're supplementing with vitamin B12 and, you know, suspect that you have a nickel or cobalt allergy, you may want to explore, you know, whether or not that supplement is triggering your symptoms or not. And something to point out too, supplements are very different than food. Like if you get your B12 from food, then, you know, that's not an issue. And B12 is found only in animal products. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Someone asked, mm -hmm. can soaps also have some levels of nickel in it? It's possible. A lot of cosmetic products do. Um, so that is something to, to explore. And I, I back to somebody mentioned that their eyelids were, were red. Um, you know, when we are using cosmetics or soaps or what have you, um, those areas of the skin that are thinner, like the eyelids, for example, because the skin is thinner in, you know, areas like that, more nickel can get absorbed, you know, more easily into the body and more easily sensitize somebody to the metal. That's great. Thank you for pointing that out. And Jen, um, I know you also wanted to uh, talk about this. I know we briefly talked about it. So is there anything you wanted to add or... If not, we can move on to the next point. Um, for the cobalt uh, and B12? Uh, points to consider following if you're following a low nickel diet. Oh, so, so there, there are a lot of points on this. So this is, <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about this. Right. So let's talk about diet for nickel allergy because I think that's sure. probably what everybody's most interested in. But so dietary absorption of nickel in the gut affects how much ends up in the body. So most of the nickel that's ingested from like food, water actually gets excreted in the urine and only a small percent gets absorbed. Um, genetics play a role. So some people end up with greater absorption of nickel and other metals compared to other people. If somebody else in the family um, is sensitive or allergic to nickel, there's a greater chance that other people in the family are going to have, you know, allergic or sensitive um, sensitivities to metals also. And again, nickel is present in so many foods. And let's talk about how it gets into the food because this is interesting too. So again, remember that 
the nickel is in the soil, which means it gets its way, you know, into our food. So plant and animal. So plants get it from the soil they grow in. Animals get it from plants and from other animals. And then humans get it from plants and animals because most of our food is either plant or animal, right? And they're getting it from the soil. So the soil strongly determines how much nickel is going to be in the food. And then the soil differs from place to place. So the levels of nickel in the soil can be impacted by like agricultural practices, fertilizers, pesticides, you know, urban waste, things like that. Um, land, so plant tissue contains four times more nickel than animals. So the total dietary intake of nickel per day is going to vary depending on how many plants and animals, you know, somebody eats during the day. And because the levels in the soil vary from place to place, um, some foods that are higher in nickel, um, you know, in, in one place might not be as high in nickel in another place. And, you know, those foods that are routinely higher in nickel, um, you know, are, are the ones that we want to look at keeping out of the diet if you're suspecting or want to try to see if that helps. And so those, again, those routinely high in nickel foods, the whole wheat, the whole grain, rye, millet, buckwheat, coffees and teas, legumes, the canned foods and beverages. Um, and in people that are sensitive to nickel, you know, keeping a low nickel diet and avoiding metal objects like jewelry, um, you know, and other things that contain nickel can be really, really helpful. Um, let me see. Is there anything else I want to mention to that? Oh, we want to talk about the points to consider, right? So points to consider if you want to follow a low nickel diet. So remember that the content of the soil varies from place to place. So the benefits from a low nickel diet are gonna vary from person to person. Remember that plants contain more nickel than animals. Plants actually have more nickel in the spring and fall, but lower levels in the summer months. And then the plant leaves have more nickel than the root and stem. And then older leaves have more nickel than younger leaves. So when we're talking about creating a low nickel diet plan, we want to avoid those foods that are commonly high in nickel. We want to avoid beverages and supplements, you know, that have nickel in them and canned foods. Um, remember that the animal, animal foods are generally lower in nickel. Um, high nickel fish, though, we want to avoid like tuna, herring, shellfish, salmon, mackerel. Dairy is actually low in nickel. So if you do consume dairy products like, you know, butter, cheese, cottage cheese, those can be okay. Um, you know, for vegetables like potatoes, cabbage, cucumbers are fine. Garlic and onions tend to be higher in nickel. So, you know, consume those in moderation. Coffee and tea are high in nickel. Avoid using the um, nickel plated utensils and don't cook acidic foods in stainless steel. And I think, I always think this point's interesting. So, the initial water flow from the tap, like first thing in the morning, you don't want to use that for drinking or cooking because it may have released more nickel during the night. And so, yeah, and the research shows that like while a low nickel diet doesn't really resolve the problem completely, it really can lead to fewer and more mild symptoms flares in those people that are either allergic or sensitive to nickel. That's an interesting stat. Thank you for sharing about that. Mm -hmm. I have someone who said they have a niece who would get rashes from snaps on denim shorts. They figured um, it was due to nickel allergy, but the allergy seemed to have resolved as she got older. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I have someone else who asks, can nickel toxins lead to leaky gut? That's a good question. Um, when... I don't know specifically if nickel specifically contributes to leaky gut, um, you know, but when we do have a sensitivity or an allergy to something that does create a state of inflammation throughout the body and inflammation can contribute to gut hyperpermeability, um, you know, and, and I think everybody's different. So in people that are sensitive or allergic to nickel, you know, absolutely that can create an inflammatory state in the body that, that can affect, you know, the body obviously systemically and certainly the gut as well. 
That's great, Jennifer. And also, uh, I think, you know, I'm on the list along the same lines of as you about how we believe in really getting to the root cause. And, and once they do, a lot of these uh, flare ups to their allergies or sensitivities should die down as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I find um, in my clients, those with, you know, food allergies, um, environmental allergies, what have you, you know, when we allergies, allergic conditions really do stem from issues in the gut. So gut microbiome imbalances, you know, when we have those types of imbalances, um, you know, 80% of our immune system is located in the gut microbiome, which is a good chunk of our immune system. So I would encourage anybody that does have allergies to anything to really check out what's happening in the gut, because that is a big component of our immune function and, and how our body responds to environmental food, you know, triggers, you know, how we react to things. It, it really does involve what's happening in the gut at a root level. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's, that's really important to mention as well. And I think next thing that we wanted to talk about was what can decrease nickel absorption from the diet? Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. So vitamin C and vitamin C rich foods so like orange juice and citrus fruits can actually inhibit nickel absorption. Um, and so one of the reasons, so we'll get into this a little bit. So iron deficiency anemia. So people that have low iron actually can have increased nickel absorption in the body. Um, the metal, so like iron is another metal, right? So if iron is low, the body is going to want to absorb something. And so it's going to absorb more nickel if that's what's available. So having adequate iron intake and in status can also lower nickel absorption from the diet. Um, and where, where I'm going with this with the vitamin C. Vitamin C, so it inhibits nickel absorption and it enhances iron absorption. Absorption. So you want to eat your iron rich foods, which are, you know, animal foods like dark meats in particular. Um, also, you know, raisins, prunes, potatoes with the skin, spinach, lentils, cashews, hazelnuts have iron. They also have nickel too. So it really can't be avoided. But again, remember that plants have higher levels of nickel than animal foods do. Um, but so the vitamin C, you know, enhances iron, inhibits nickel, and then calcium also inhibits iron absorption. So if you're having calcium rich foods or taking calcium supplements, take those away from your iron rich foods. Thank you for sharing that. This is a complete side note, but I just want to share, so like I'm part of a mom's group and some of them were saying how they had really low iron. And then one of, the, they said they started getting really weird symptoms of craving really weird things like chalk, yes. craving laundry detergent, craving like bleaching like chemicals. And apparently it's called pica, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. So when their iron gets really, really low, they get like all these strange cravings for really strange uh, things and ingredients and chemicals. Just thought mm -hmm. I, I would share that random fact of the day. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And it's so, I, that's a point that I remember from my initial schooling in nutrition, which I won't even tell you how long ago that was, <laughs> but it, but it was, it was, I think, um, you know, people who were like eating dirt, essentially, like really craving these random things that, you know, tent like dirt, there's some iron in there, right? So it's like, you're craving that nutrient. So when you're low in a nutrient, you know, iron, in this case, you might crave things that might have iron in it, like these weird things that we shouldn't be eating. <laughs> yeah. So if any of you guys have any of those symptoms out there, uh, just get it checked out and check your iron levels just in case. And if you're going to check your iron levels, ask the doctor to check for ferritin also. So the general blood markers, you know, like hematocrit, hemo hemoglobin, your red blood cells, um, those are like the last things to change if you're low in iron. Ferritin is your iron storage protein. It's the first thing to dip if somebody's low in iron. So by the time iron deficiency shows up in your regular blood work, you're way iron deficient. So ask for that ferritin level. That's great. I've also heard of uh, people getting dry skin because of low iron. And I've heard of people getting uh, blood transfusions. And they said when they got their transfusions, 
they felt so much better and their skin felt a lot better as well. So just want yep. to share that interesting fact too. Low iron, I've also seen it cause itchiness in some people. So, you know, if you're suspecting that you might be low in iron, and a lot of people I'm finding, you know, with skin rashes can be low in iron. And, you know, if we're looking at how this connects back to the gut too, I see H. pylori, you know, in a lot of folks, you know, in the gut when we do testing, um, H. pylori is a bug that we don't really want to see in there, certainly not at high levels, and it can actually um, interfere with iron absorption. So like if you have rashes, if you suspect you're low in iron, if you haven't checked your gut, definitely, you know, check all of those things out because they all are connected. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And that move that moves us on to our last point, which is the top 10 suggestions for addressing a nickel allergy. Okay, so let's start with we talked about some of those like when creating a, um, a nickel diet. But so, you know, number one, if you suspect that you have a nickel allergy, talk to your doctor and get tested. Um, if you want to try an elimination diet short term only, like try it for a month, see if it helps. If it doesn't, move on, you know, add those foods back into the diet. And we can, again, I can provide those links of the couple resources that I use um, if you want to check out an elimination diet for nickel. Um, if a low nickel diet does seem to help, there is some research that shows that you might be able to desensitize to it talk to your doctor about that. It's not a do-it-yourself situation. Um, there's also some research that shows that taking a probiotic um, and combined with a low nickel diet and people that do have a nickel allergy can help with skin symptoms. Um, the other points that I think are important to include are remember that vitamin C rich foods inhibit nickel absorption. Make sure your iron status is on point, you know, to that can also help inhibit nickel absorption. Um, remember that plant foods are higher in nickel compared to animal foods. And have I gotten to 10? <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's see. Almost there. I lost track. Almost but there. Okay, a couple more um, that maybe that I have. Oh, the cooking utensils. So avoid cooking and especially cooking acidic foods and stainless steel. You want to avoid you know, canned foods also because the ions, the metal can leach out into the food. Um, I think, have we hit 10? I think as long as you got the top <laughs> ones, I think that we're good. Uh, but I also had someone who asked, um, has has anyone ever had allergic reactions when drinking from a metal cup? So have you personally heard about anyone who has had any of those reactions? I haven't had anybody specifically that has like reacted to a metal cup. And I haven't had anybody that has specifically said, you know, oh, I have, you know, nickel allergy and I, you know, cooked tomato in a stainless steel pot. Like I, I haven't heard that level of detail. Um, the level that I've, you know, experienced this at has been, you know, cl uh, clients that have like a diagnosed nickel allergy um, that do find some relief from being on a low nickel diet. But in terms of like specifically identifying one thing versus another, um, I don't know that we can actually identify like one specific trigger because, you know, nickel is so prevalent in so many foods in so much, you know, so many things in our environment. So we're exposed to it constantly, you know, so that's why it's like maybe, maybe somebody noticed it, you know, after they were drinking, you know, out of a cup, but you know, what else is happening around? So it's, it's that cumulative effect. And so, you know, if, if you do suspect an allergy, or a sensitivity, you know, what you really want to do is not focus on trying to remove it 100%, but hit on those high points, you know, and, and limit exposure to it where you can. Yeah, especially since having a restrictive diet can be tough on our mental health as well. T very tough on mental health. And, you know, I work mostly with children. And, you know, it, it's a really, really slippery slope when we do this in children. We do not want children on a limited diet of any kind. You know, if we're eating whole real foods, 
Um, you know, those should not be triggering unless somebody has identified IgE allergies to something, you know, then sure, keep it out, you know, of the diet, keep away from whatever it is. But in the absence of tested IgE reactions to something, we want to keep it in the diet. Um, especially with children and you know research has shown that avoiding common allergens for example like we had been led to believe was the way to go for so long doing that actually increases the risk for developing food allergies down the line especially when somebody already has eczema so if a child already has eczema but does not yet have identified IgE food allergies it's really important to introduce those foods to prevent the development of the allergy later. Because with a broken skin barrier, it's much more easy to get sensitized through the skin. And then we develop a subsequent allergy to it. So get it into the gut, that immune system is stronger than our skin immune function is. And actually, Jen, uh, while we're on the topic of the food allergies, I would love to get your thoughts for our listeners, because you mentioned how removing certain foods can introduce allergies down the line, but not only allergies, but also anaphylaxis, anaphylactic symptoms for certain individuals, which is still rare, but it does happen. So what are your thoughts in the case that that people are worried about that happening? So if you are afraid to introduce those common allergens for fear of anaphylaxis, like if you have a family history, you know, your kid is at higher risk for developing those allergies, talk to your allergist. Um, a lot of pediatricians, allergists, like you can do the oral food challenges in the office, you know, with the doctor. So if that makes you more comfortable, um, if you don't have any reason to believe that there's, you know, an existing allergy other than, you know, stuff that you've read online or, you know, you've read about an elimination diet, you can try to introduce the foods, you know, yourself at home, um, keep Benadryl handy, let's be honest, just, you know, keep the Benadryl there just in case. But when you try a new food, what you would want to do, you know, for example, for your baby or your infant, you know, put your finger like, you know, in the food, rub it on the inside of the lip, and, you know, wait a few minutes to see if there's a reaction. If there's not, then that's okay. Um, if somebody is going to be allergic, like an IgE anaphylaxis type reaction, it's going to happen fast. Like typically within a few minutes, you know, if it's an hour or more and, you know, somebody starts getting a little red, that's typically not an allergy. It's more likely a sensitivity. Um, but just make sure you work with your doctor on all of that because everybody is different. And if you have concerns, absolutely just do it with your doctor and don't, you know, do it yourself. Great, great tips. Thank you so much. So uh, one last question someone said is, I know you touched upon patch testing as a way to diagnose a nickel allergy. So this person said, I tested for nickel allergy in the skin contact patch test. Does that mean I am allergic to ingested nickel too? It can be, yes. So if you've tested positive with the patch testing, then any nickel, so whether it comes in, you know, exposed to it on the skin or if you ingest it, it's possible that it's going to cause symptoms for you. So Thank that, you. yeah, so, so whoever that was, you may benefit from a low nickel diet and avoiding nickel in your environment as much as you can. That's great. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Jen. Those are really, really great uh, tips. I just still love this comment how someone said, well, wish my dermatologist mentioned or had told me this. Uh, Jen, any uh, last things or words or tips you want to share before we end our interview today? Yeah, I think just the most important thing, and I, I feel like I harp on this all the time, but I can't say it enough. Um, we don't want to be on a restricted diet if we don't have to be. So we want the diet always to be as broad as possible, adults, children, you know, everybody. So if you suspect that you have a nickel allergy, you know, step one, I really would encourage you to go get tested first and determine, you know, if the diet is in fact necessary, because a low nickel diet can be extremely limiting, which isn't healthy for anyone and certainly not children. And, you know, we don't want to restrict nutrients that they need for growth and development. Yeah, that's yeah. really important. Yeah. So get tested.
That's great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jen, if people are interested in contacting you, where can they find you? Sure. So my website, um, Jennifer Karen Brand Nutrition. Um, it's all together. So Jennifer Karen is spelled C A R Y N. So Jennifer Karen Brand Nutrition, and also on Instagram. Um, that's where I do most of my um, educational posts and all of that kind of stuff. So you can always find me there too. And that's Jennifer Karen Brand. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's been tuning in. I know we've had quite a few people. So I hope that was helpful for all of you. And stay tuned for some of our other interviews that we'll have for you as well. Bye.